So hot on the heels of looking at energy resources, we really have to look at climate change next because climate change is related, at least we think in the, in the modern day, in modern day terms, we think it's related to the release of carbon dioxide and methane, some, but it's really the burning of fossil fuels that we worry about the most. And so there are a few molecules that we consider to be greenhouse gases. When those greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, they can actually trap more heat than in, in excess of what our, our world really needs. And so it heats it up somewhat. And so we see as a result of that uh, melting of glaciers and sea level rise as a result of the melting of glaciers. So we're going to talk a little bit about climate change today. We don't when necessarily if, okay, like on the, on the title page of this presentation, you can see people ice skating and standing on the ice, even playing golf. On, on some of the ice areas in the Netherlands. And so that was back in between 1350 and about 1850 that there was a time period called the Little Ice Age. We haven't experienced anything like that since 1850. And in fact, that was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. So that's when we first began to burn fossil fuels and the climate heated up after that. So this is a talk about climate change. We're going to talk about a few things then about climate change, how it happens naturally, and then of course the human-induced sort of conditions we think that are occurring as well. So climate is defined as the average weather that's in an area over a certain number of years. Usually it's around 30 years. And uh, we normally attribute climate to the effects of solar insulation. Now it's a word, well I have kind of a muddy accent, okay, but, but solar insulation is the amount of sunlight that hits the earth and delivers energy to the earth's surface and to the atmosphere from the sun. So it's S-O-L. Insulation is the materials that we use to kind of shield or protect us from either excessive heat or excessive cold, right? So this is not the same thing that you would put in a wall, okay? So a construction uh, for wall, um, you know, retention of heat or, or the retention of cooling, let's say. So insolation, you know the name of our star, uh, star is Sol, right? The sun is called Sol, S-O-L. So solar and then solar insulation, it's, or solar irradiance is another way that people often put it. So it's the amount of energy that strikes the Earth from the sun's radiation, essentially. So climate change occurs naturally, but it can also be induced by humans. Those are just the facts. Um, we've had four major time periods on Earth when there have been massive ice ages. And so the first one was actually before many of the, the animals were even around. Uh, there were some primitive animals that were around and cyanobacteria and that sort of thing. But we're really talking about a time period called the Precambrian. And so that was roughly 800 to 600 million years ago. So that's way in the distance, but it was a time period where people actually think that the earth may have almost frozen over. It was, it was that bad, okay? So they, they have a hypothesis. It's called the snowball, uh, snowball Earth Hypothesis. And so, but, but that's beyond what our considerations are all about. We want to talk about the modern climate. So there was another time period. The second in geologic time was at the end of a time period called the, the Late Ordovician. So the Late Ordovician, at the very end of the Ordovician, roughly somewhere around 460 to 430 million years ago, there were ice ages again then. So these were glaciers actually that were on top of the northern part of Africa at that time. That's when Africa was rotated slightly different in near polar position. And so the late Ordovician extinctions are associated with that glaciation in fact. And so it's one of the five major time periods when we have extinction of animals on this planet. And some of the earliest animals went extinct at this time. Everything was pretty much marine at that time in fact. So it was a massive die-off of some of the animals at that time during the late Ordovician. Pennsylvanian and Permian. Now we're getting closer now, so we're roughly 350 to 250 million years ago. And during the Pennsylvanian and the Permian, and actually it even extends a little bit earlier than that into the Mississippi. And so they call that time period, in fact, the Mississippi and the Pennsylvania together, they call it the Carboniferous. 
or the local rocks around here are mostly Mississippian, but there are a few Pennsylvanian age rocks around this area. There were river deposits. And so even above that, in fact, you have to get out to central Kansas, but around Topeka and places like that, you get the Permian period there. Well, the end of the Permian is associated with one of the massive extinctions as well. It's the largest that we know of on Earth. But it is related, we think, in fact, to probably global warming, that one. And so that one is related to the issuance of gases into the atmosphere that would have heated things up. So, But there was an ice age before that. So that was during the, the Mississippi and Pennsylvania Permian, so it's the Carboniferous and the Permian there. And part, some of the rocks around here reflect that sort of climate change. And so we're going to why, how can you detect ancient climate changes? We're going we're gonna to look at that a little bit. But just let's l cap it off. The, the fourth major time period of ice ages on this planet has been during what we call the Pleistocene time period. And it is actually considered an epoch, so it's a smaller scale than a period, really. But, but it's 2.6 million years ago to roughly 11,700 years ago. We can be fairly precise on these age dates, in fact. And that is the time when we had woolly mammoths, we had saber-toothed tigers, we had giant ground sloths that covered the landscape as well. Um, we had cavemen, okay, so human beings are actually a Pleistocene species out of Africa, in fact. So we came out of the savannas of Africa, and climate change drove some of the early migrations of humanity across this globe. And it's relatively recent history, right? So human beings, the, the modern human beings, have been around for roughly half a million years. So we evolved during the Pleistocene. And people think about cavemen, well, that's what we were, and that's really technically kind of what we still are. Um, so it's we live in caves still, and we still try to dominate our environment, and we're the apex predator for this entire planet, even if a few of us get picked off by, by, uh, by saber-toothed cats every once in a while, you know, by tigers and by lions and things like that. Of course, you know, and sharks and so forth, by far the largest... Um, the largest uh, cause of death among human beings, if we wanted to pick a species, would be other human beings, okay? So um, don't put it beyond human beings to kill other beings, I guess you would say. We are the apex prey. We are the, we that Pleistocene species. So how do we go about understanding these ancient climates? Ancient climates, in fact, we have a pretty good proxy for it. Um, and many of you will recall, early on in the semester, we talked about limestone. Limestone's made out of calcite. Calcite's made out of CaCO3, right? So it's a calcium plus the carbonate ion. That CO3, in fact, includes carbon and oxygen. Both carbon and oxygen have isotopes. These isotopes can either be stable or they can be radioactive. Carbon-14 is an example of a radioactive carbon isotope. When it decays, it turns back into nitrogen, in fact. So, carbon-14 doesn't help us much with ancient climates, but carbon-13 th carbon tells us a little bit about ancient climates. Carbon-13 seems to be correlated with ocean productivity, the primary productivity in the oceans. And so there's carbon-13 and there's carbon-12, and the, the, the propensity, of course, is for living organisms to try to incorporate uh, you know, carbon-14 into our, our bodies as well. But carbon-13 and carbon-12, uh, are that ratio between the, those two, that's referred to, in fact, as delta-13C. Oh, uh, delta and so that's called, um, it's a stable isotope of carbon, right? So... But we, we associate it with, then, of course, the productivity of the oceans. Oxygen's the other one. Oxygen's are really important. Oxygen's typically 16, and there's also 17 and 18. So there are some heavy oxygens, and then there's an intermediate oxygen, and then there's a light oxygen, the 16, right? 16, 17, and 18. And so but we, if we keep track of just the 18, the heavy isotopes of that, and we compare it to the lighter isotopes, the 16s and 17s, we, we have a ratio with that. And so that, that amount of delta-18 that differentiates from the other oxygen isotopes, 
We call that delta 18O, and it is a stable isotope of oxygen. So delta 18O is correlated with the ancient temperature and ancient glaciations, in fact. And so when you have an ocean full of water, it has hydrogen and oxygen that make up that water, right? The oxygen is preferentially going to evaporate in as uh, oxygen 16. So oxygen 16 is, should be more plentiful in the Earth's atmosphere. When it rains or when it snows, it's usually a lighter isotope that then gets locked up eventually as glacial ice in the Arctic regions, Arctic and Antarctic regions. And so you would have a preferential fractionation, they call it, of delta 16O in that ice. And what it means is during times of glacial ice, you will actually have oceans that are enriched with delta 18O. So the lighter, the heavier isotopes stay behind because it's the heavier isotopes, it's harder to evaporate them and put them into the atmosphere. So instead, the lighter isotopes go there and make up the glacial ice. So when you melt glacial ice, that glacial ice then mixes with the oceans and it dilutes that delta 18O. So you get lighter values of delta 18O during times that are hothouses or greenhouses. <clears throat> We may be going into a greenhouse, and so the way to test that hypothesis, of course, is to test the seawater. Does the isotopic value of seawater change? There's a couple of different ways that they do this, but I think it's with the standard mean oxygen um, content. So I think it's called SMO, standard mean oxygen of water, okay? So the content of delta 18O and delta to uh, delta 16O in, the, in standard seawater, okay? So that is the proxy that we use then for looking at ancient climates. So we can go into ice cores and look at the isotopic records in the ice cores, but we also can look at ice cores for the gases that are trapped in the ice because when it snows, it also traps some gas. And one of the gases that it traps is atmospheric, well, air. And in air, there's a little tiny bit of of carbon dioxide and so we can actually track back through ice core records all the way back about 650,000 years ago ice core records tell us the carbon ice the uh, carbon dioxide content of the atmosphere so that's another way to look at ancient climates as well so we're going to look at some of these records now here is the record for all of those ice ages that I told you about previously except for the Precambrian one. The Precambrian one would, would be off to the right-hand side of this diagram. But in fact, you see then the late Ordovician, so that's marked with the O here, and the O at the very bottom uh, scale down here. That's in millions of years across there. So at the left-hand side, that's zero, that's today. If you go to the right-hand side of that scale in this graph, you'll actually see the Cambrian, and that's CM. So what's on the right-hand side of the Cambrian, in fact, is Precambrian. So it goes on all the way back to, you know, 4.56 billion years ago, right? But, but between 600 and 800 million years ago, that was an ice age. And this shows you the ice age that followed that. So if you look at the red line there, and that red line kind of shows you how it went from hot to cold down here at the bottom, and so you can actually see, and that's based on the delta 18O, the L delta 18O. That's just the average value for each one of these. So it's kind of a running average, that red line across here. So with that peak, that spike, that blue spike that you see there, that's the pretty close to the terminal Ordovician right here. So it's actually a valley. And so they mark the glacial periods with that blue sort of uh, period, uh, blue sort of span of space down at the bottom down here. So that is the terminal Ordovician extinctions that happened in the beginning of the Silurian time period then. And then if you follow it along to the left, you'll see the next major peak where it was really hot, and then it goes back down again and cools and stays cool for a while. And then you get a hot period, and that's beginning in the Permian here. So Permian is marked with a P, and C stands for Carboniferous here. So Carboniferous would be including the Mississippian and also the Pennsylvanian here. But that's our second glacial time period here. That's when all the continents were actually together, and we had a supercontinent then called Pangaea. 
So Pangea, when you have supercontinents, you can actually have large ice sheets over part of it. And it's a time period, in fact, when Gondwana had ice sheets. You may remember the Dwykatillite. That's one of the Permian sort of like uh, glacial deposits that's in South Africa. So in the south of Africa, there were glaciers at this time. In fact, also in Australia and also in South America. And even in India, because India broke apart. So we had to wait all the way into the... To the uh, to the Triassic before that continent broke apart. So if we follow it upward through time, you can see it got really hot again during the Permian here. And then it kind of cools down a little bit during the, the Jurassic and on into the Cretaceous here. So the Jurassic is marked with a J. The Cretaceous is marked with a K. And then it, it actually heats up again after the KT boundary. It heats up quite a lot, in fact. It, it even heated up during the Cretaceous as well. So um, that's a time period when seas covered western Kansas and eastern Colorado. There was a seaway that went all the way from the Gulf of Mexico to the Arctic Ocean. But that disappeared when the mountains rose up. When the mountains rose up, it kind of changed things. But then, boom, there's a meteorite that strikes the Earth from outer space, caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. It caused climate change as well. But then we go into a time period, and you can see it marked on here as a PG, that stands for Paleogene, and the N stands for Neogene. So those are the two time periods that are closer after about 65 and a half million years ago, or 66 million years ago. So that shows you that it cooled and cooled and cooled all the way down here to today, essentially. Well, we have ice caps, okay? So those ice caps began to form back during the Eocene, in fact, the late Eocene. And so, um, the ice caps in Antarctica, we didn't have ice caps in Antarctica. If we had trees in Antarctica in, in the Eocene, and then later on those trees died. I'm actually one of the few people that's actually gotten to see a piece of wood from Antarctica. It's a piece of wood that dates back 50 million years. It's not fossil wood. It's not, it's not petrified wood. It's real wood that was desiccated, ancient, ancient wood that was preserved in some of the glacial deposits that, you know, move some of that woody material around some of the earliest glacial deposits in Antarctica. And so, um, yeah, so it cooled off all the way into the Pleistocene. So we've had a cooling since roughly the end of the Eocene. And Antarctica began to form. And then later, Greenland began to form. And then at times, it kind of heats up a little bit. Greenland disappears. Maybe even West Antarctica could disappear. But then it grows back, okay? So uh, that's what we have as a record of the long-term sort of like changes in climate on this planet. It happens naturally. I'm going to tell you why in a minute. If we go to the next one here, I'm going to zoom in on that Neogene and the Paleogene, which is slightly older, right? So here we're looking at a, at a time chart here that goes from, well, it actually starts in the Cretaceous here. So, but that's the Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, and then the Pleistocene down here at the end. And you can kind of follow that green line. If you follow that green line, it heats up, it heats up, and you can actually see a, a little acronym on here. It's called PETM. That is a time period on Earth that was called the Paleocene Eocene Thermal Maximum. It's one of the hottest time periods, at least in the last 60 million years or so. And so after that, we get what they call the Eocene Optimum. And so there's a still hot temperatures, right? Based again on that Delta 18O. When it says benthic on there, what it means is they take little tiny forams out of the oceans that are made out of calcite. And they use those uh, to sample for the isotopic composition of the calcite that forms that, that shell. And so if you trace that, just a, one component of the deep sea life, essentially it's something that would have lived in the water column, would have been exposed to the mixed ocean waters and everything, records a record of the Delta 18O. We can plot that on this chart and you can see that it's related to warm going upward and cool going downward. So if you follow this thing off of the Eocene optimum there, that's when we first began to have, well, you just get into the Oligocene, and they say that Antarctic glaciation occurs there. It happened a little bit earlier, but not much. So you can see a big drop off there on the temperature, and it stays cool for a while, and then it kind of thaws a little bit. They, they call it the Antarctic thawing there at the end of the Oligocene. 
and then it goes into the Miocene, and then the temperature begins to drop and drop and drop. It goes through the Pliocene and into the Pleistocene. By the time we get to the Pleistocene, we have full-blown glaciers on this planet. In fact, much of North America, much of Asia was covered by glaciers all the way up until about, well, 20,000 years ago was the last glacial maximum. 20,000 years ago, sea level was about 150 meters lower than what it is today. And the people that would have been around back then, if they lived in coastal areas, they would have been living on that continental shelf that today has been covered by seawater and sediments now, too, as well. So that's what happened during the Pleistocene. So we began to have glaciations, and so the glaciers built up. And then there would be times of thawing in between then. So people have claimed that during the Pleistocene, there were maybe as many as 8 or 10 or 12 glaciation events. But in between, you get what they call the interglacial events. And so that may be what we're going into right now. So it's something to be concerned about, I guess I would say. Um, but that's the record for just the last 60 million years, 65 million years or so since the Cretaceous here. So if I were to list out all the things that were kind of important for climate, just over that last 60 million years, we have that PETM event again, right? That followed by that Eocene optimum. Okay, so we're talking about really warm temperatures all through that time period. It was a major greenhouse age. And so trees were growing in Antarctica, as I mentioned previously. Greenland would have actually been green and ice-free at this time. The Arctic Ocean, this is, a, this is really wild. The Arctic Ocean would have been kind of blocked off from the rest of the ocean so it wouldn't have circulated with the rest of the oceans and it became a freshwater lake for a while. So the Arctic Ocean became ice-free but it was fresh water. And if you see the jar on the right hand side, um, the, the cool thing about that, well okay I'm going to tell you about it in just a second here, but the Gulf of Mexico, okay you know the Gulf of Mexico along the southern states down there, there's a little piece that would have extended all the way up to where the Mississippi River flows through Missouri today. And they call that the Mississippi River Embayment. That thing would have been active at that time during the Eocene. In fact, they find the remains of crocodiles and alligators and things like that in the Boot Hill, Missouri, and some of the sediments that are down there. Um, not commonly, but they do find some. So. Uh, what happened at that time. So if we had a freshwater lake in the Arctic Ocean, there is this aquatic fern that began to grow. It's called azola. Azola is what's in that jar on the right-hand side. Actually, one of my close friends, Dr. Chris Barnhart, had some of this, and he gave me some of this, so I have some of this in my house right now. That is azola in that jar right there. It's an aquatic fern, and it leaves these little tendrils into the water down below. And there's a cyanobacteria that lives with it, and the cyanobacteria fixes nitrogen. And the azola itself, of course, has chloroplasts in it, and it photosynthesizes. So it draws carbon dioxide out of the, out of the air. And that thing grows just in water, all by itself. And so, it, in effect, it's found over much of, the United, well, much of the world today. They find it in places like rice paddies in Asia where it grows in amongst the rice. It keeps the mosquito population down and it also fertilizes the crops there because once this aquatic fern lives and dies, it falls to the, to the bottom and provides nutrients for whatever plants are living in that sort of aquatic situation. In the Arctic Ocean, there, were, there was nothing else to live there. And in fact, so when that material would wind up falling to the sea floor, it built up a mat that was about eight feet thick. And so people have speculated, and at least this is the theory, the common theory is that Azola changed us from a greenhouse and put us on the direction back towards an ice house by locking up carbon dioxide. It sequestered it. I mean, that's one of the, the ways that you stop you know, global warming, perhaps, today, is like they talk about sequestering carbon dioxide, so the emissions from power plants and places like that, if there's some way to capture it and take it and put it back into the earth. And that's what was happening naturally with Azola. So Azola was able to capture some of that carbon dioxide sequestered in the Arctic regions when it was fresh water. Now today, the Arctic Ocean, of course, is salt water. 
So azole, as far as I know, won't grow on salt water. It's probably a good thing that it doesn't because in many places it's regarded as an invasive species, but, but if it's serving a very good purpose, that's not a bad thing. Okay, one more time to, to, to tell you some of these things. I put numbers on it this time between 52 and 57. I'm just going to leave it at that because you've already been exposed to some of these climate changes, okay, that have occurred. Okay, well, I'll give, I'll give it to you quickly here. So there are alligators that lived in Missouri for, among other places, right, all the way up to 78 degrees north latitude. Between 52 and 36, the cooling is the... East Antarctica uh, ice sheet began to grow at that time, and so the glaciers began to move and push sediments out of the major valleys into uh, West Antarctica at that time, and that's where some of this tree material was that I got to see in Antarctica. And so between 36 and 20 million years ago was the first of three major uh, cooling periods, a 12 degree centigrade drop in temperature in North America. Between 20 and 16 million years ago was a warming period. You'll see that in that graph that we saw previously, two slides previous to this. Between 16 and 5 million years ago was the second major cooling time period, and so the ice cap formed on Greenland at that time, and it covered much of Scandinavia as well. So Greenland and Scandinavia both were covered by ice at that time, and it was later that we had more of a warming time period. There were actually trees that were growing on Iceland. Now, there's a few trees that are planted today, but they just don't grow naturally there. They have to be planted and and so forth in Iceland. Um, but in the last 3 million years, or really it's 2.6 million years, the cooling began in earnest. And, and even with the cooling that began 2.6 million years ago, all the way to 11,700 years ago, there were time periods when there was warming in between the cool periods. I'll show you a diagram that, sh that illustrates when that occurred. The last time that we had a major climate warming was in a time period called the MIS-5e. It's a marine isotope stage 5. And it was the, the oldest of those, it was five, one of the oldest of those, 5e. And so that was a time period roughly between 80, 85,000 years ago, actually it was 120,000 years ago, maybe 125,000 years ago to 85,000 years ago, a 40,000 year span of time period when global sea level was about 7 meters higher. It's a, I think I've shown you some pictures from, from uh, Jamaica that show that high stand of sea level that occurred at that time. So that is kind of the timeline that we were looking at. If we look back just recently at the benthic uh, forams, again, and looking at the carbon isotope frequency over the last five and a half million years, you can see how there's a lot of jaggedness in that sort of like record, okay? So the time periods of major climate change. But, but in, in general, if you see the part there that's about two and a half million years ago, uh, that's when we began to have some major cooling then, okay? So uh, two and a half million years on here. So there's a, there's a drop, a significant drop. Actually, it's 2.6 there. So it goes above that dotted line, and then it drops and never comes back again until you get down here to roughly, oh, about 400,000 years ago. Hmm, less than half a million years ago. Uh, fewer than half a million years ago. So that is the isotopic record, yet again, used as a proxy for ancient climate. And so people do that for a living. They study ancient climates for a living. So now that you know that there is this record of paleoclimate change, and you know that there's some concern about modern climate change, what was really controlling some of this? Because that's way before people burned fossil fuels. I mean, the, the, the only thing that humans could burn all the way up until about you know, 3,000 years ago was wood, okay? So they burned wood for fire and cooking, and there weren't that many humans around back then. So, so what happens? What, what caused the climate to change with this vigorousness, right? Um, part of it is, of course, attributed to this insulation. Well, what's controlling the insulation then? How come that varies? How come we get a different kind of solar radiation from from one period to the next period. Well, that's part of the story and we're going to talk about it. There are really three main processes that, that, that control ice insulation. And so also what's important to also is the, the distribution of oceans and continents. When you have one supercontinent, you're more likely to have a major ice age event. 
The wind and atmospheric circulation patterns also play a, uh, an aspect in this. Ocean circulation patterns also play an aspect. And where you get mountain barriers that will actually cause an orographic effect, perhaps, and change the precipitation patterns as well. You're not going to have an ice age unless you have precipitation. So, obviously, the shapes of the open, all these other, th there's a whole bunch of factors that affect climate, but it took one person to figure it out, and he used what he understood about the Earth-Sun relationship and just the Earth parameters themselves. And so they're called orbital parameters. And the guy who figured this out, uh, this out was a mathematician. And his name was Milutin Milankovic, Milankovic. And so Milankovic lived from 1879 to 1958. And so he recognized that there were patterns in the way that the Sun and the Earth interact with one another. There are time periods when the, the Earth actually is wobbling a little bit, and that happens on a regular basis at about 23,000 years. That's called precession. There's another thing that changes the inclination of the Earth's rotation from something that is relatively low to something that's more aligned with the rotational axis, let's say. It is the rotational axis, but it's, but it's more aligned with it, what we would have as, a, have as a, uh, a bar magnet if it was north and south, right? So that inclination, that's called obliquity, and that changes on a regular basis of about 40, it's actually 41,000 years. And then there's another factor that relates to how the Earth orbits the Sun. Sometimes the Earth orbits farther away, and then sometimes it's much, much closer or much more circular in its orbit. Now, Earth orbits the Sun in an, in, a, in an ellipse, and it was Johannes Kepler who came up with that idea. But he said there's this ellipse, but sometimes that ellipse is kind of more central, <laughs> so it's more concentric, you could say, around the Sun, or it's more circular around in its orbit around the Sun. And other times it's more eccentric, and so it's been stretched a little bit, more like a rubber band when you stretch a rubber band. Instead of being a circular band, all of a sudden it becomes much more elliptical. And so when that happens, it changes the amount of insulation the Earth gets. So the cyclicity for that, there's actually several cyclicities for that. 98,000 years is one of the cyclicities, but you can also get 125,000 years. And some people speculate there's a 400,000 year cycle as well. Milankovitch cycles are what these are called. And it became known as Milankovitch theory. It was posed a long time ago. People kind of forgot about it for a while. And then they tested it. They tested it with drill core in the Pacific Ocean, and they were able to then compare that Delta 18O record with what had been calculated for what the solar insulation should be. I think it's for 45 degrees north latitude, and they matched almost perfectly. I've got a diagram to show you that. First of all, I'm going to go through these orbital parameters with you just one by one once again. If we look at the largest scale, the one that has a 400,000 year scale, or 125,000 years, or 98,000 years, each one of those, it has to do with how you stretch the orbit of the Earth around the Sun. On the left-hand side in this diagram, you can actually see where it's more eccentric. In other words, it is not very circular. If you look on the right-hand side, it's more circular. We have more equitable or more common solar insulation when we're going around in a perfect circle around the sun. Now, the Earth's distance to the sun changes from somewhere around 91 million years, excuse me, 91 million miles to 93 million miles. That's the distance we are away from the sun. We're at 91 million, I mean, that's today's orbit. We're at 91 million miles when we're closest to the sun. And that would be what they call perihelion here, and that's January the 3rd. So that's the northern winter. But it's the southern summer. And so the southern summer is, you're 2 million miles closer to the sun in a southern summer than you are in a northern summer. Okay, so they call that distant direction, and that happens on the 4th of July. That's called aphelion. That's the farthest we get away from the sun, and that's uh, July the 4th, and so that's the 93 million mark there. <clears throat> so that is when we have an eccentric orbit around the sun. Uh, Kepler said that there are actually two 
points in an ellipse that the Earth would then go around. Now, I want you to think about this a little bit. So where is on this circle, on the circle that's on the left-hand side, where is it going to be going fastest? Well, it's going to be going fastest, the Earth's progress around the sun in one revolution. So it takes one year to go around the sun, right? It's going to be going fastest during the austral summer, which is the southern summer, which is perihelion there. So it's going to speed around the sun and kind of get slingshotted out more distance when we have the aphelion. And so that's the northern summer down here at the bottom. So we don't get quite as much solar insulation as you do in the in the summer summer, uh, in the southern summer. So it's much more equitable if we have a round orbit. But we don't have a round orbit right now. So it's not all that round, in other words. It varies, 91 to 93 million miles. That's called eccentricity, that process. And the time frame for changing, from going from something that is stretched back to a circular orbit, that's somewhere between 98 million years and 400 million years. In fact, all of those things work together. Kind of, so it oscillates like this, right? So every 98 million years it may squeeze back, and then 120 million years there's a little projection outward. And then 400 years it may get a little bit of a peak out there. So um, the next one, if we look at the inclination of Earth's orbital axis or Earth's rotational axis to true north, in case, or actually, yeah, to, to, to true north, there is, an, okay, so it's not really true north. What is it? It's actually the, the north south relative to the sun, okay? So if north and south are a bar that goes entirely through the Earth, it's not exactly centered on the North Pole because the Earth spins off on an axis like this, and that's about 23.5 degrees today. But that, that angle actually changes through time every 41 million years, <laughs> or 41,000 years, and it can change somewhere in between 22.1 to 24.5. And so that, that's called the obliquity, and so the obliquity changes. Now, if you think about it, if you are facing that north, northern hemisphere into the sun, you're going to have and absorb more energy through time. And so if we were at 24.5 degrees right now instead of 23.5 degrees, all of Earth would have more insulation because if you think of the sun on the... When, when the Earth is closer to the Sun, even during perihelion, it's still going to be 24 and a half degrees. It's going to get more insulation, even in Antarctica, right? So, um, so that's what we call that variation in that axis. It's called obliquity. Oblique. How oblique is the Earth spinning around its rotational axis? Now, because we know the Earth is spinning around that rotational axis, there's also a tendency for the Earth to kind of wobble a little bit as though it were a top. You know, tops will spin, but when they begin to like run out of that rotational momentum, they then begin to wobble, and that's called precession. So precession is this capacity to wobble in that orbit. It doesn't change the obliquity. The obliquity is going to vary on a different time frame, but the precession, that wobble, changes roughly every 19.6 million years all the way up to 26 million years, I think it is. It has some variance in that one. And so the wobble may be more pronounced at certain time periods. So those are the three aspects that control solar insulation. And so again, the wobble is going to affect how much solar insulation the Earth receives as well. So in this diagram, you can see those cycles. And so eccentricity is at the bottom. It's the long time frame, right? So every 100 million years, roughly, you can find, follow the peaks and valleys, and you'll see that they kind of fall on 100,000-year cycles that way. If, and, and so uh, today, it shows us uh, right there with the zero line. It's projecting what it should be into the future, in fact, there. Now, the next one, the middle column there, is a 40, it's very conservative value in 41,000 years. That's how the, the orbital, the rotational axis will be, the obliquity changes, right? So every 41,000 years. So each one of those hills and valleys in the second curve here is related to obliquity. And the top one, of course, is precession. 
Now you're saying, it's like, okay, well if all of those things are going at the same time, which one is controlling that insulation? Well, the answer is they're all three controlling it because you have to sum up those three curves. You add them together in order to get what the solar insulation is. And they didn't prove this until 1976 with those deep sea cores, with the deep sea bithic forams. And so when they took the oxygen isotopes of that, and it was a strong argument. It's like this seems to match up. So in the next diagram, I show you the same figure with precession at the top with 1922 and 24,000 year cycles. Obliquity is the second with 41,000 year cycles. And then you see, okay, so there's a little bit of variance in what people publish about this, but 95, 125, and 400,000 year cycles. So where's the 400,000 year cycle, you may ask? Okay, so if you look at the bumps, and this is in the blue line that's the third curve down here now, and we're looking at now on the left-hand side, and if you go backwards, you can kind of follow the hill, valley, hill, valley, hill, valley. And so each one of those is about 100,000 years. But if you look, there's a long-term trend on there as well that seems to lump about four of those cycles together. That's your 400,000-year cycle. And you can look at the, you know, the time frame at the top, in fact. And so you can say, oh, there's one major 400,000-year cycle. Here's a second one over here at 800,000 years. And then it would continue on off of the chart on the right-hand side. So precession, obliquity, and, and eccentricity, when you add them all together, that's the yellow line down here. That's called solar forcing. And that's the solar irradiance, if you will, 65 degrees north latitude here in the summer. And so that's the northern uh, insulation, if you will. And so <clears throat> if that's the insulation, if you look at the bottom curve down here, that has nothing to do with Milankovic, the predictive Milankovic parameters based on what our inclination is relative to our rotational axis or the eccentricity or any of those things. Compare the yellow line to the bottom line down here and what you will see is there are spikes. Those spikes correspond to hot events, the valleys, so that's the peaks. The valleys on there correspond to the cold times. And that's all based off of oxygen isotope. It's the delta 18O that gives us that cycle at the bottom. So if you try to compare that to the yellow one, the yellow curve on there, you'll see that the peaks and valleys tend to line up, sort of. So there's a peak that lines up there, another 100,000-year peak that lines up with the second one. And, and so the times of major glaciation are the time periods, well, that are, you know, shifted to the bottom there. And so you can see that there's a peak of heat, and then it drops off fairly slowly, and then you had an ice age, and then a peak again. Well, we had an ice age 11,700 years ago. That is the base of that valley that's farthest to the left on that black line. And so then it heated up. And sea level rose, of course, sea level rose 120 meters, okay, in the last 10, 20,000 years it's ro rose that much. In the last 8,000 years it's rose, um, gosh, it's r risen, well, um, almost, um, it's risen a lot, okay, so last 8,000 years it's, it's risen about 60 meters, I think, something like that. And then, of course, there was a little blip you know, 100,000 years, but that's, that we're talking way back, right? So, in fact, that is the peak. The last peak that you see on there is about 120. That's the MIS-5E right there. So there's the peak for today that's right on the edge on the left-hand side of this diagram, and then the peak after that, that's 120,000. That's the MIS-5D major time period when there was warming, global warming. In fact, all of Greenland had disappeared at that time. That's how you interpret these curves, in fact. So Milankovic parameters show us that there's a natural tendency for climate to vary naturally <laughs> um, based on the solar insulation, and that's all related to the Milankovic orbital parameters. It's the relationship between the sun and the earth and how much energy strikes us. It's a one-on-one -on -one correlation right there. That is pretty cool. So we go to the next diagram here. It's an expansion of some of the more recent so over the last 650,000 years. Now this time I have to warn you, today is over on the right hand side. There's no convention for showing which sides today, okay? So, but if you go to the right hand side over there, 
on the right hand side, that is the warming that we have today, that peak thermal period that's marked in yellow over here on the right hand side. And we go backwards in time to the left on this diagram, on the previous diagram was to the right. That's our ice age down here at 11,700. So they have names for this, right? So that's called the Wisconsin. Before that, there's one called the Illinoisan. They had other names for these other time periods in here where there were warmings and glaciations, but we just say that it's pre-Illinoisan now if there's any glaciation that preceded the Illinoisan. So there's Wisconsin in on here, there's the Illinoisan, and then there's the pre-Illinoisan, all of these other ones in here. And that's the blue parts on here. That's when there was glacial ice. And you have this record of heating and cooling through time naturally. Well, human beings didn't even show up till about 500,000 years ago, so that's way back here at this warming period, and then it kind of cooled off after that. And uh, so it's like, you know, there's several ice ages that human beings have been through. And it has, well, people have argued that, you know, these times of glaciation like this actually cause a lot of response in the speciation of animals and the evolution of animals and so forth. And so certainly human beings are tied with this in some way. Uh, for our record, this is all Pleistocene glaciation until you get to the very end down there. They call it the Holocene. And it's, it's a, an interglacial, of course. We only have Greenland. There's a little tiny ice cap on Iceland. But then there's East Antarctica and West Antarctica, so the Antarctic continent is covered with ice. Greenland is partially covered with ice. Most of Greenland is covered with ice. But it is melting at a rapid rate, faster than people had expected. And so that is the record of glaciations. Now, if we zoom in even closer now at to what the records are, and so now we're looking at actual records of a different sort of, uh, of means, okay? So people use a different means like tree ring. There's a whole bunch of different ways that people measure the more recent temperatures, in fact. And so uh, that goes from zero, that's zero AD essentially. There is no such year as zero AD, but there was the beginning of the common era. We can call it CE or you can call it AD, whatever you want to, but that's the year 2000 on the right. So it goes from 2000 years ago up to today or, you know, 20 years earlier than today. But this is actually designed to illustrate that we have this temperature record that goes back for 2,000 years, roughly. And we can get that out of ice cores and other places, tree rings and so forth. If you look down here at the very bottom, and we're looking at temperature again, right? So there's this tendency to go a little bit cold. Well, that's that little ice age down there. So the Little Ice Age is actually a result of some of the natural processes that are going on. We still didn't have the mass burn-off of fossil fuels at this time. There were humans around, of course, but, but nothing. Uh, we don't burn anything or put anything into the atmosphere on the same level that we did prior. You know, and since then, since 1850 roughly, so 1850 you can see the temperature just rose dramatically there. But let me give you some illustrations of what it was like during that little ice age. So there were even ice ages just as, as recent as 170 years ago. So in other words, here's another diagram that shows you Holland again. And a mill off on the right hand side and you can see some ships and all out here frozen into the ice. And you know, this is a, a place that has seaports and things like that. They would freeze over, so Rotterdam and Amsterdam and uh, the polders are these areas where they uh, diked off large areas of the North Sea in order to turn it into real estate, to farmland, so they could farm and, and feed themselves. The little ice age did not help them. Let me, let me give you an illustration for this, in fact. In the 1300s, in, in, in England, they were raising grapes and making wine in England in the 1300s. By the 1350s, then it all stopped because of this ice age. It's like climate changed, like abruptly right then, you know. And so it, it changed abruptly. Here's another image from that time period. Again, people skating on the ice. Yeah, I think there's actually some stories like Hans Breaker and the Silver Skates that illustrates some of what happened at that time. Uh, you can see here, though, another village covered in snow and a very austere sort of place. 
And it kind of correlates with some of the austerity of that part of Europe, I guess you could say. Very straight-laced Protestants that were in this area that, you know, they were they all embraced Calvinism. This was probably God's judgment on them at this time. And so here's this ice age that struck. And the next one, it's a little bit more comical because here you can see, while well, he's strapping on his skates over here on the left-hand side, but here you can see on the right-hand side, somebody actually broke through the ice. So I don't know if this is an indication, maybe a little bit of warming or something, but you can see people skating around and here's somebody slipping and falling on the ice in the far distance in the background here. Um, and again, these are all paintings. We don't have photographs from that time period up until about 1840 was the first you know, images that were made. And so, but nothing of, uh, of that little ice age that we know of, except in the Alps. And so in the Alps, there's a few photographs. I'll show you one of them that I know of, uh, but, but this in fact. So the weather patterns in Europe are that the Alps get the really, really cold weather. And if you get farther to the north, it's actually warmer. So like in the Netherlands, it should be warmer than what it is in southern Germany. And so, in fact, you get lots of snow and ice, you, as you might expect in Switzerland and in southern France. So this is an area here that's called the, uh, I think this is the Mer de Glace. And it's uh, the Rhone River actually flows out of this glacier. It's the headwaters for the Rhone River. Uh, Chamonix. And this is uh, Mont Blanc is here. Uh, the White Mountain, of course, and then, uh, but this is a painting, or it's actually a, a lithograph that shows that glacier. And so, um, in the next image, so this is from 1870. So I'm going to give you the years that go along with this. That's 1870. In the next image here, that's in the 18... No, that's... If that was the 1870, I think this would have been 1900, as I recall. This is a photograph here, so this is a photograph from 1900 showing you that same glacier. So the same glacier is there, just to show you how precise, so if you, if you page back to the, the previous image, you would see how precise that painting was, or that lithograph was. Here is a location of it, and so it's flowing out of the mountains here. And uh, so actually this is mirrored, this is one that is it is not the source for the Rhone River. This is the one that flows into Lake Geneva in Switzerland. So this is actually in Switzerland here, the Mer de Glace. This is not Chamonix yet, in other words. So, but that's the Mer de Glace right there. And you can actually see it flowing. And you can see the termination of that, um, the glacier. There's actually a moraine, a pile of rock at the end of it. And the glacier is retreating. And so that's one of the things that people like to record is, where is the glacier going? And so that is the Mer de Glace. But now we're going to look at the, the uh, glacier, the Rome Glacier. And they built a building actually right in front of it here. It's always been a popular ski area in the wintertime. You can see the glacier in the background here. This is from 1870 actually right here. So this 1870 uh, etching here compares favorably with the one as a, f a tinted photograph in the next image here from 1900, so 30 years, that's the difference in what happened. They built another building in there, you can see on the right-hand side. And so that, um, that resort is still there today, it's still there today, but it's a long ways from the, from the end of that glacier, from the terminus of that glacier. And uh, so in the next image you can actually see what it looked like, I think in 2000, 2005, somewhere in there. But that glacier has advanced, you know, it's, it's actually receding. Um, the way glaciers work, it's a little bit odd, and I wish we had more time to cover this in geology. But uh, glaciers work as like a conveyor belt, and so the ice flows forward, but then if it's not flowing out as fast as it's receding, the, gl the whole glacier as a whole will recede backwards. And so the glacial ice always moves forward, but it doesn't always extend farther because it's melting at the same time. So if we go to the next image here, that's a little bit closer image here, and you can see the same glacier. Now it's covered with rocks and debris and, and all sorts of material. And so we're going to go to the next image here, and you can see the end of the glacier today. Uh, so this is a relatively, I think this is 2018 right here, and you can see the terminus where that lake is right there. Um, so that is the Rome Glacier. And the next image is a Google Earth image of the same feature. And this is near Chamonix, 
uh, Mount Blanc in that area. And so you can see the glacier flows to the south here. And um, if you look very carefully on this, uh, you can actually see one of the, the switchback roads that leads up into the mountains there. Actually, it's on the left-hand side, and that's about where the that uh, resort was in the previous etchings and, and so forth here. So the glaciers retreated roughly, it looks like about two miles. So, I mean, that's in the mountains, that's in the, the Alps, right? So you look at glacial retreat in the Alps, it's pretty common there, in fact. It's evidence for glacial warming, right? So that's happened just in the last 150 years here, right? So we've gone into a warming period after that little ice age. So we call this sort of phenomena global warming. We've been increasingly alarmed about this over the last 50 years, roughly. Now, when I was a student in elementary school in 1970, I lived in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and that's when they had the first Earth Day. And we celebrated Earth Day at the, at the elementary school I was at. And people talked about what's going to happen in the future. And I recall as a child listening to a news report that said, we are going to perhaps have another ice age coming on. We were 180 degrees off on that prediction. Because in fact, by all rights, by, by that reports that came out, you know, in eight, 1976, right, Milankovitch was right, and by all rights, we ought to be dropping off of that curve and going into an ice age. It didn't happen. And it didn't happen for a very specific reason. And that specific reason is by 1970, actually by the 1950s, 1850 we began burning coal, and that was the Industrial Revolution, right? Industrial Revolution put pollutants into the atmosphere like crazy, and it kept doing it forever. <laughs> And it's still doing it today. Um, we release greenhouse gases at an alarming rate. More than we ever have, because there's a lot more people today. Okay, so we have a lot more needs for transportation. We have more needs for consumer goods, and that's all produced, and it takes energy to produce it. We need energy to heat the houses, to heat the schools, the municipalities all have, you know, means for generating electricity, but but in fact, we're burning, <laughs> we're burning fossil fuels for that. And so if we just look at global warming, that's defined as an increase in the average temperature of Earth's atmosphere. And so we can measure the temperature in the atmosphere with, with balloons. We can do it other, other ways as well. Um, and so we measure that average temperature, and then it goes into a huge data, data complex, I guess you could say. It's big data. And we try to figure out exactly how is the Earth behaving. So NASA is really good at this. They use a lot of satellites and things like that in order to make the surface temperature. But you can actually look through the atmosphere and measure some of the parameters of the atmosphere as well. And they're able to do that. But balloons are one of the, the primary ways that we do it. And you can actually sample the content of the atmosphere, the gaseous content of the atmosphere with balloons as well. Um, so global change is a more apt description of what we worry about really. Global warming, we worry about that warming because that's going to directly lead to glacial loss and it's going to lead to sea level rise. We call it eustatic rise. It's going to be a global sea level rise. It's not going to be just in one place. The seas are all connected, so it's going to affect every place. Um, but we call it global change, so it's not just that. It's also going to affect the, the, the heat and cool areas. We make it a more pronounced polar vortex because of this. Some more oscillation in that sort of like cold weather wave that seems to sweep through the Midwest on a regular basis these winters now anymore. Uh, we get a lot less snow than we used to and the winters are actually warmer, but we get hit with these massive cold, cold snaps. If you haven't, if you recall, it got down below zero this year, which is very unusual for Missouri. I think it was like minus 10, 10 below zero. That's unusual. That's the sort of weather you have in the Dakotas, right? So we don't usually get that in Missouri. So what's causing this? Well, it's really what we call the greenhouse effect. The greenhouse effect are the gases in the atmosphere that trap excess heat from the sun. So if the solar insulation comes in, it's absorbed by the Earth's surface, and then at night it's re-emitted 
in, in a different waveform. It comes in during the daytime as UV radiation and it tries to leave. We heat up the rocks with that UV radiation and, it, and, the, and the atmosphere and you, you know, the lower atmosphere and then it heats up also the soils and everything like that. And it tries to re-radiate it at night out into outer space, but it can't do that because the gas is trapped. And so that's called the greenhouse effect. And so we, have, we live in a greenhouse essentially on Earth. We've always kind of known that ever since, you know, the snowball Earth. Snowball Earth is when we probably didn't have a greenhouse effect. And so that's what it would be like if we didn't have the greenhouse. This would be a cold, sterile planet because the water would freeze solid. We're far enough away from the sun. We don't get that much energy because of our atmosphere, however, we trap energy. And so that's a good thing, actually. So it keeps life on this planet. But it's the excess heat that we kind of worry about because if things get out of balance a little bit too much, then you could go and melt all the glaciers. We're going to have sea level rise. It's going to have a major impact on all the humans and all the other living creatures on this planet as well. So we're looking at things that are going to melt the ice caps. We're going to have rising sea levels, flooding the lowland islands and things like that. Already in the South Pacific, there are island nations that are having to move their people to places like New Zealand uh, to, to avoid the huge storms that come in. If you're only a meter or two above sea level, you have to get off of that island because one hurricane could wipe out your entire island. Typhoons, they call them in the Pacific. But we're drowning coral reefs. We're actually causing that excess heat to kill corals as well. It's called coral bleaching. Coastal areas are at risk right now. Well, if you go to California, it's not so bad, but if you go to the east coast of the United States, that's an area that's subsiding fairly rapidly. And because it's subsiding, there's not enough sediment that's being shed off into the coastal areas. And so those are areas that have uh, marshes and they have tide, tidal flats. So these tidewater areas of Virginia, of Maryland, and Delaware and places like that, and then also in the North Carolina and South Carolina, Georgia, those sorts of areas, and, and Florida as well, those areas are going to be flooded by sea level, uh, sea level rise, and of course that's going to bring salt water in as well, and that's going to affect the freshwater aquifers. Now we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next, in the next section here. It's going to be the last section we get to talk about. We're going to talk about water, so we don't get to talk about glaciers. We are going to talk about water. So, if global warming is real, uh, what do we do to predict exactly what's going to happen? Well, there's no way to predict exactly what's going to happen. But there's a lot of the brightest minds that are trying to figure this out. So, in the United States, we have the National Council, the National Council for Research, right? So, National Science Foundation is another sort of organ you know, um, institution that grants money to people who study climate change. Um, so, you know, there's a few people that are selfish, I would say. They say that global warming, that's a good thing, right? So you won't have to go south for the winter then, right? And then they point to like, oh, remember that snowstorm? That's your global warming for you right there. I was like, no, nah, I'm going to call BS on that, okay? Because that's not true. Because it's an average, really, that counts. And what really counts, in fact, is that Yes, we probably are going to have increased productivity in plants and things like that. Things that are going to absorb that carbon dioxide that may be in excess. That is true. But with sea level rising, our coastal areas are at risk. Roughly half of the world's population lives within 500, 500 kilometers of an ocean. So uh, it's going to affect the world economies. Think about all the other nations that are affected. Half of China will be underwater if we melt the glaciers. If we met, if a world without ice, the eastern half of China is going to be underwater. The Gulf Coast states, half of those states will be underwater. Many of the island nations will be underwater. So, it's a real issue. I mean, much like, I just recently had a, a colleague who visited from the Netherlands. He's, he's originally from the Netherlands and experienced some of the storms in 1853. He's 69 years old, and he says, oh, we're really worried about it because sea level rise was going to go right over the top. So how do you, how do you stop that from breaching many of these dikes? It's going to be hard. 
So, you know, it's going to take a lot of thought. We, so, governments of the world have gotten together and signed an accord. They call it the Paris Accord, right? So the Paris Accord, we, before that we had the, uh, well, what was it called? It was the Kyoto Protocols, right? So the Kyoto Protocols were signed in 1992 to try to be the first attempt to control climate, you know, from a human perspective by reducing our emissions. And there's certain people who don't want to reduce our emissions. They want to keep producing emissions just as much as they possibly can, which is a little crazy and selfish if you think about it, because sea level doesn't affect everybody. Sea level is going to only affect those areas that are near the coastlines, right? And if it doesn't affect them, what do they care, right? So it's like, that's not the way to think about this. You know, one of the things we do in Missouri State is we believe in ethical leadership. We believe in cultural competence. And, and so these, we have to think about these things. We want to be good citizens, in other words, okay? And so um, global warming can be a real devastating, it could be a game changer on this planet. So if we melt the ice caps, not a good thing. Um, yeah, we don't want to be spoiled this. We want to leave it a better place than what we came into, I guess, as I would say. We know today that the mean surface temperature is rising. We know that the atmospheric temperature is rising as well at a slower rate than what the, 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 the mean sea, turf, uh, sea surface temperature is rising. Um, the uh, carbon dioxide content, we know that's going up. We've measured that in places like Hawaii where on a regular basis you can see the, the yearly increase in carbon dioxide. In fact, it's as high as it's been in the last 650,000 years. That's that one diagram I showed you, right? And so energy consumption is at an all-time high, right? Well, it was at an all-time high until the pandemic hit and it shut everything down. So emissions actually dropped off with the pandemic. But as we open up again in the post-pandemic world, we're going to see a pretty rapid increase in the consumption of energy products. Oil and gas are likely going to rise because the pandemic is over as well the prices as well as the emissions that are out of gas burning, you know, but fuel burning um, transportation devices. Alpine glaciers are mostly receding. There's a few that are uh, advancing in a few places around the world, but they're not very many. Uh, most of them are retreating. There's one in, uh, specifically, if, you ever, if you're really interested in this sort of material, uh, and we talk about sustainability, so sustainability, it's a major climate plays uh, into this in a huge ways. There's a place called Glacier Bay in Alaska. It's a national park, in fact, and so uh, in that national park, you can actually look at the historic record of how that glacier has retreated. Now, it's a glacier, in fact, that formed an ice sheet, essentially, but the glacier's been going back for like two, three decades now, and I'm not talking just a mile or two. We're talking about tens of miles, okay? So it's disappeared, practically. It's very much at the, the headward regions of Glacier Bay now. They used to, this is one of those places where they would take a boat up and then they would blow the horn and watch the glacier cat. Well, they don't want the glaciers calving off into these fjords anymore. Uh, so we know the sea level's rising. We know Antarctic ice sheets are collapsing as well. Now, they're, not the, they're actually floating on water, so when they collapse and float out to sea and break apart and form icebergs, they aren't actually rising sea, causing a rise of sea level, okay? But we do worry about loss of the glaciers that are grounded on continents. And so Greenland, West Antarctic Ice Sheet, and the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, all of those are grounded on solid ground. When you melt those, it's not like an ice cube floating in a glass of water. Ice sheets are. So if you lose an ice sheet, that, that ice cube is eventually going to melt somewhere in the seas. But, if you lose the ice sheet, those ice sheets are what are holding back the glaciers that are grounded on the earth, you know, the, the ones that are on dry land. And so if you lose those, and these things advance then into the sea, they're going to disappear as well. So the glaciers are going to disappear probably first off of the Antarctic Peninsula. It's going to disappear out of Greenland first, but then the Antarctic Peninsula will go next. We know the sea level is rising. We know that storm activity has increased dramatically in the Atlantic and somewhat in the Pacific as well. Uh, and lastly, there's this sort of nasty thing that came about 
because we began to study the atmosphere that we discovered through satellite imagery and also through some of the balloons that are flown up to capture atmospheric gases, we made a mistake. We made a huge mistake, in fact, in the 1950s and 1960s, 1950s it began. In the 1950s, they began to manufacture CFC molecules in order to cool things, right? We used them in refrigerators, in uh, any sort of air conditioning and things like that. And so CFCs and also propellants in spray cans, right? We're using CFCs. And so CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons. Now, in and of itself, a chlorofluorocarbon is also a greenhouse gas, but we don't release enough of it to be of concern for global warming in that aspect. But instead what happens, and we this is the law of unintended consequences, CFCs got into our atmosphere and it ate a hole in the ozone layer. And you may say, so what's that got to do with global warming and stuff like that? Well, it's not directly related, but that hole in the ozone layer is what blocks some of the UV radiation that strikes the Earth, right, in the most sensitive areas, in the polar areas. So there was a hole at the North Pole, there's a hole at the South Pole that's even larger, and it went away for a long period of time. We found out about it in the late 1980s, I think, and they banned the production of CFCs. And then people cheated. They began to produce them and say they didn't and they would use them and say that they didn't. And then there was a release of CFCs in the atmosphere. And guess what? The ozone hole came back. We had actually caused it to reduce to such a small amount that it was almost healing. It's like picking the top off of a scab. It'll never heal if you keep doing that. So, um, yeah, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let me explain a little bit about the atmosphere first. So we're going to talk a little bit about it. There are different parts of the atmosphere. I'm going to go through this pretty fast because I know I'm already a, an hour into this presentation and I don't want to bore you to death. But at the same time, this is really important. This is the stuff that's going to affect your, your future. So pay attention. <laughs> uh, the troposphere is the lower part of the atmosphere. That's the weather zone, essentially. Above that, we get the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is this area that's kind of sensitive, but it's got that protective ozone layer in it, right? It's a natural protective ozone layer in it. Above that is the mesosphere, and above that is what they call the ionosphere or the, tro or the thermosphere. And so it's a funny sort of arrangement, but there are certain levels to the atmosphere, and they all behave differently. So if you know that the Earth has layers, so does the atmosphere. In the next diagram, it, des it describes these and puts them on a chart over here so you can see the troposphere. You can see the tropopause there, actually. That's the top of the weather, the main weather zone, essentially. That's about as high as the mountains are. So uh, that's about as high as what Mount Everest is today, so all almost 30,000 feet. And so you're 10 kilometers up into the atmosphere. Below that is the troposphere. That's the zone where we get most of the weather. If you get the ice crystal sort of clouds and things like that, that's up in the very highest of the clouds, and that's the cirrus clouds that are marked on this diagram as well. But that's in the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is above that. So what you see here is not only the delineation of the troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, and then thermosphere up there. There are some delineations in this that track the temperature. We have the warmest temperatures at the Earth's surface, and then it cools as you go upward into the mesosphere. And then it heats upward. It heats upward till you get to the stratopause there, and then it cools off again in the mesosphere. Well, the mesosphere is the one, of course, that has the CFCs in it, right? And then it heats up again in the thermosphere, you know, the outer stretches of the atmosphere. Now, if temperature has this capacity to cool, warm, cool, and then warm again, atmospheric pressure decreases the whole way up. So the atmospheric pressure goes to, you know, almost zero at the top up there. You're in outer space almost, right? You're at the very limits of the atmosphere, in other words. So that is a cross-section of what it's like in the atmosphere right here. The mesosphere and the, and the ozone layer are like this, okay? Now, ozone. Ozone is commonly thought of as a pollutant, 
Ozone is actually the chemical formula O3. So O3 is what you get in places like the LA Basin when you see that orange cloud over the top of that city. That's ozone. And it's a bad thing because it traps the heat in, okay? And it traps pollution and people breathe that, okay? So all of the car fumes and things like that get trapped below that ozone layer. So the ozone layer forms a shield, but it's also, you know, it, it shields us from some of the UV radiation. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice here a little bit, but but in fact, it also traps the pollutants down at the lower, in the troposphere, in that lower part down there. So that is the mesosphere right there. Okay, just a diagram to show you the electromagnetic spectrum, just so that you remember that we see things in the visible light spectrum. If you get a little bit higher frequency beyond that, remember that the, we go from red to purple, essentially, or violet at the very top up there. And that's the, that's the visible light spectrum. Above that, we call it ultraviolet. It's even beyond the violet spectrum, and ultraviolet is what strikes us from the Earth. It's the sort of thing that gives us a tan. It's the sort of thing that we try to guard against, actually, with things like sunscreen, because sunscreen puts a layer on you that protects you from those harmful UV rays that can eventually give you skin cancer. Okay, I'm, a, okay, I'm old enough. I've actually had some lesions cut off from places where my ball cap doesn't cover, and you have to watch those things when you're older because those things can turn into skin cancer. That's from the ultraviolet ra violet radiation in my life, living under the sun. That ultraviolet radiation is what hits the earth from the sun, and it goes through a phase transformation. Once it strikes the earth, it then tries to get re-radiated as heat. The energy strikes us and it turns to, to heat, essentially. That's why you feel warm after you've been in the sun. It's ultraviolet radiation, but also in some infrared radiation from the sun as well. But at night, it's the infrared that tries to escape. Now, the ultraviolet is either going to be reflected or it's going to be absorbed by the Earth. But when it gets absorbed, it gets re-radiated after that phase transformation into infrared. Okay, very quickly, I'm going to, I'm going to show you a, a couple of things here. I'm going to show you the ozone layer over the Antarctic. Now this was in 2003. It had healed up from that substantially and now it's back again. So um, when we talk about the gases that actually trap heat in the atmosphere, there are some surprising ones I think. Among those carbon dioxide, you knew that one probably, so carbon dioxide is from the emission of fossil fuels, right? Methane is another one they actually have a greater release of methane around some oil production facilities than what previously was recognized when people came back and tried to sample areas and they realized it's like, wow, this is a lot more methane. Now, if you look at CO2 and if you look at CH4, that's methane, right? Those are both carbon-based molecules. So there's a carbon in the middle and two oxygens on either side. It's a linear molecule. For methane, it's a four-way molecule like this. What happens is ultraviolet radiation strikes those molecules, and they actually retain heat much easier because they, are, they actually get excited, if you will. And uh, so that is CH4 and CO2. Nitrous oxide is another one, N2O. Uh, Perchlorofluorocarbons, uh, PFCs, perchlorofluorocarbons. Uh, Hydrofluorocarbons, HFCs are another one, and then sulfur hexafluoride is another one. Those are all greenhouse gases. So the emission of those gases into the atmosphere has a potential for trapping heat in the lower uh, atmosphere. They differ from CFCs, but the CFCs can also be considered a minor role in greenhouse gases as well. So um, if you look at the next diagram, it shows you the UV radiation strike in the Earth. In fact, we get all of the various kinds of radiation strike the Earth. Some of it's reflected back into space. Some of it hits clouds and gets reflected. So if it's a white surface, ice has a good tendency to reflect radiation back into space. But at night, very commonly, we trap that radiation. So um, if we did not have the greenhouse effect, 
if we didn't have this sort of trapping of energy, we'd have a planet that ranged somewhere between 15 to minus 18 degrees centigrade. It would drop um, the temperature on Earth if we didn't have that. And so it's a good thing to have the greenhouse effect, but to have too much of it is not a good thing. And so 30% is, is reflected, 80% or 70% is absorbed. And then, of course, it's re-emitted in that infrared spectrum here. So if we look at the infrared radiation that's emitted at night, there's a map of that, and you can see that there's belts. Now, why is it cooler in the middle? You're probably going, why doesn't it radiate? Well, those are the, those are the rainforests. So the rainforests keep us from getting overheated. The deserts are where most of the red is on here. And so those are the rainforests that cover, you know, the tropical areas of so Southeast Asia, Borneo, and, and places in Indonesia and so forth. And then, of course, in the north, we have the northern forests, okay? They don't absorb quite so much radiation, so it's not emitted from there quite so much. And in the south, of course, it's the oceans mostly, and even Antarctica, right? There's hardly anything that's, you know, emitted from there in the form of infrared radiation. In the next diagram, uh, it shows you the reflected solar radiation, and then it shows you the emitted radiation as well. That's in watts per meter squared. So again, forests are really good for making sure that we have a regulated climate. Um, so one of the things that you can do in order to help guard against climate change is to plant trees, as it turns out. They're carbon neutral, eh? I mean, actually, you can form carbon credits, right, by having a forest. There are, there are companies that specialize in that. They'll buy some acreage in the, in the Brazilian rainforest, and they sell carbon credits from that for areas that have a cap-and-trade in carbon. And so uh, there's some issues with it, though, right? It's a human sort of construct. And there's two issues with it, actually, is how much carbon does it actually absorb and are they reselling the same carbons that <laughs> capture that they've sold to another company? So I heard a recent interview, I think it was on BBC actually, it was BBC Radio, that they talked about that. And so you know, are they really ethical companies is a thing, right? Because you don't want to you don't want to buy your carbon. But see, companies want to balance out their carbon footprint and they'll buy these cap and trade stocks that are you know, holding corporations that own the forest, but how long are they going to own it? Are they going to own it for a little while and then open it up to forestation, to deforestation, to, to the harvesting of the trees? Those are a lot, there are a lot of unknowns in this sort of thing. So solar flux. Solar flux comes in and it gets re-emitted. You've already seen that before, so I'm going to move on to the next one. If we look at just the greenhouse gases, they're going up. Uh, we know that the average global temperature is going up as well. We know that historic sea level rise is going up. This is a, 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 an image that shows that. I'm not going to belabor the point, but that's a NASA satellite over here. I think it's the, uh, oh, what is it called? It's, it's not Poseidon. It's um, something X. Um, it may be Poseidon. I don't, I don't know exactly what it's called, but that instrument that's on that, um, I'm going to have to look it up. Okay. So I will make a little annotation up here so that you can look at this. Well, actually, it's going to be up there, okay, a little annotation that uh, will tell you exactly what the name of it is. I'll have to look up the name of that instrument. But anyway, sea level is going up. You can actually measure sea level from outer space now. Um, if you look at the land surface temperature, we're not looking at the oceans now, just the land surface temperature, it's going up. If we look at the nations, and this is old data, but if we look at the nations that actually emit most of the carbon dioxide, United States, Western Europe, and China. Boom. And India's rising dramatically as well. And in fact, if you think it's bad now, wait till Africa gets going because Africa is going to have a huge resurgence of productivity. And so the entire world is going to be cranking out you know, greenhouse gases. And so if we signed an accord in 1992, that kind of fizzled out. The United States recently rejoined the Paris Accord and uh, the Climate Accord. Just this year, actually just a month and a half ago, we rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. Um, 
people have to get into your minds that this is not going to cost jobs. It's going to create jobs. It is going to have some impact on the climate because if we do nothing, it's going to go crazy. So if we have some impact, we just don't know what it's going to do in the future. We don't know how, how much of an impact that we can have right now just by reducing emissions and so forth, right? So we're going to try to cut the emissions by one quarter, I think. That's the, that's the goal of this, to do that by 2050, I think. 2050 is going to be too late. Um, yeah, so one of the things that they want to do is to reduce, it's not even, <laughs> they don't want to reduce the, the global mean temperature, they just want to keep it low. So they want to say, let's put a cap on it. We just want to have a two degree increase in, but preferably 1.5 degree increase centigrade globally, an average, right? Every degree that you go up, you're going to raise, all of the problems are going to become manifest. And I'm going to tell you, you know, if I witnessed the first, the first Earth Day, in 1970, April 22nd, and I was worried about climate back then, maybe going into an ice age. I'm not worried about that anymore. We're not going to go into an ice age. We may go into a meltdown. Um, we already are in a meltdown, most people would say who are climate scientists. Um, if you think this is all political, no, it's scientific. <laughs> and this is where it's Politics should not play a role in it, and we need to listen to the experts on this and try to make it possible to kind of slow down the temperature rise uh, because it's not natural. It's not natural to have emissions. We have taken materials and energy resources and released it back into the atmosphere when it was captured maybe 300 million years ago, maybe 100 million years ago, maybe 50 million years ago, but we captured it. Well, it wasn't human beings that captured it. It was the plants that lived and died that made the algae that lived and died and gave us the oil and gas. And then the, the woody products that gave us the peat, that gave us the coal eventually, that's the material we're releasing, that sort of carbon dioxide that has been around for 300 million years. It's... We're, we're living in a casino and we're making some bets and we're trying to mitigate our losses right now. I guess that's what I would say. Because our world's going to change dramatically if we have sea level rise. That's probably the number one concern. If you talk about heat going up, that's a major impact if you live around deserts. Because there's going to be desertification around all of the deserts. But as far as the massive global impact that's going to be the biggest, it's going to be the biggest on living organisms. It's going to be big on humans. You know, a lot of people say, let's save the planet, right? i got to tell you, this planet's been around for four and a half billion years. It's not going anywhere. Even if we had another huge meteorite impact, it's not going to destroy the Earth. It's just going to destroy all the living things on Earth. That's what we have to care about. And so all of the people, all of the animals, we're their caretakers. If we're the apex predators, or the apex beings on this planet. I try not even to be a predator, okay? So I'm almost a vegetarian, I'm a pescatarian. I'll eat fish, but I don't eat any of the red meats and I don't eat anything. I'm trying to be responsible. I do that because my wife is, okay? But my wife, it's a conscious way to live and think and eat, okay? So it's every aspect of your life influences this planet, in fact. How you drive, what you drive, whether you recycle or not. How about you turn the temperature on in your, your house, your apartment, when you're in the wintertime? You may want it nice and warm and toasty. But remember, you pay those bills, right? So, you know, that's... It costs something. And it costs something not just monetarily. It costs in the emissions that we have as well. So, one last slide to leave it with you. What can you do? Um, where your where concerns? Is it important to you? First of all, you have to figure that out yourself. I can't, 
I can't force you to think anyway, right? I can only tell you how I think, right? Um, I have a pretty fuel efficient car. And I also have a truck that I hardly ever drive that gets eight miles per gallon. But I don't take it anywhere, right? So I only use it when I need it. Um, I have a house that I heat. You know, it's, it's modest, really, when it comes right down to it. It's not a McMansion. I don't have 45,000, 4,500 square feet in my house. I barely have over 2,000. Um, I try not to live extravagantly, I would say. Um, I support climate. I support climate studies. Um, I don't want to embrace climate reactionary folks. Let's save the planet, that sort of aspect, because I think that's too alarmist. But at the same time, they may be right. Um, so I try to be pragmatic about things. I know that people have to have jobs. I know that we have to have goods delivered to us. And electric, electric vehicles are going to come. It's, it's, not a, it's a matter of time. It's not going to happen. It's not going to be within your lifetime. Everybody's going to be driving electric. And there's going to be the odd you know, polluting car that drives down the road. And you'll pay a tax for it, right? So you're going to pay your carbon tax on a, on a vehicle that burns diesel or a, a vehicle that burns gasoline. Um, so drive fuel efficient cars if you're driving one right now. Uh, reduce the needless trips. Use a, use a bicycle or do as I do. I walk every day. Walking is a zero emission, zero emissions so sort of activity. Excuse me, hiccups. Elect folks to government who understand these sort of issues because there's a lot of people who really don't and and I'm worried about that probably more than anything right now because there's a lot of people who believe, well, conspiracy theories. They believe a lot of lies really right now. And so that worries me more than anything. This is not a political science class. This is not a politic class. But I'm saying elect people who are knowledgeable and understand the importance of science in our everyday lives because that's the one thing we can trust. We don't want to be fooled. And so that's important. So scientists take that sort of like onus on. We have that task in order to like speak truth to power or speak truth in general and to elect the people that we know are going to help make this a more sustainable world. Um, if you drive cars, get a tune up. Um, plant trees. If you can plant trees, plant trees. And in the end, the decisions that I make are going to affect you, and the decisions that you make are going to affect me. And the decisions that I have made and that I will make in the future are going to affect you more than the ones that you make that are going to affect me, because I'm older. I've been on this planet longer. And I'm sorry if I made any mistakes in the past, but I try to be a thinking person. I try to have mindfulness and practice mindfulness, knowing that what I do affects other people. My habits affect other people. I love going to recycle things. I drive out. I, we don't have curbside recycling where I live. Our company, we don't, I don't want to pay the extra money for that. So I have to go out that way anyway on the south side of town, southeast corner of town. There's the Lone Pine Recycling Center there. I take my metals there. I take my glass there. I take my paper there. And I take my plastics there. And they rec recycle each one of those products. They even recycle yard waste. So uh, I take the yard waste out to my farm, actually. It's mostly composted, but it's not all composted. I have to burn some of it sometimes just to get the trash out of the way because it keeps growing all the time. I'm happy for that, actually. I've, I've got 27 pecan trees out on five acres out in the country around the, here. I'm very proud of that, actually, because pecan trees are one of those sort of like, you know, trees that are going to neutralize my carbon footprint. I feel good about planting trees. Um, and I feel really bad about cutting them down, but I have to sometimes. We got one world. We got one world. We have 160 some countries. We got 8 billion people that are going to be on this planet within the next 10 years, 15 years maybe at the most. And so, so what do you want to do? How do you, how do you want to treat the planet? It's not the only issue we're facing, frankly. So that's going to be the last topic for this class. Is we're going to talk about water. We're going to talk about surface water and the characteristics, and you're going to understand more about water than you ever wanted to. 
but you also have now an understanding of climate change, I hope. Um, anyway, thanks for your attention. I can't be real optimistic about this one, you know. But in the grand scheme of things, I'm still going to be on this planet even after I die. But I won't be able to affect any change. I can affect change right now. And so you make use of that useful time that you live. And try to help people, I guess. Because the decisions that you make in a landlocked state like Missouri impact the people in coastal areas around the world. So, be good. Um, yeah. Talk to you soon. Thanks. Bye now.